Well, welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. My name is Reverend Jonathan Murray, and alongside Reverend Caressa Murray, we are co-pastors here at Covenant Presbyterian and to the community of Bryan College Station. We are gathered for worship on this Friday, a Friday that certainly is loaded with contradictions. But you are invited to join in the worship along by responding with the bolded words as well as reading through the scriptures and listen for God's word. There will be music in the service, but we will not be singing. So I invite you to listen to that music, and as you do, listen for God. Let it echo within you. Today's service is one that is focused on the events that surround and led up to Jesus' death on the cross and being laid dead and the tomb. We call this service Good Friday, and as I mentioned, it is a day of contradictions, to be sure. For while we are always dying and rising to new life, maybe especially it is on this day. For our story is part of this story, and this story is ours. We add our voices to the shouts of crucify. We are the ones, the disciples, who stand at Jesus' cross as he hangs there in our place. We are also the disciples who run in fear. We are the soldiers who dress him in that purple robe and that crown of thorns that were pressed into his head. Today, we lament the pain of this world and we admit our participation in that pain. And while we are participants, let us instead seek to be witnesses to and participants in God's power over the evil in this world. Let us join our voices in our call to worship. On this Good Friday, we gather to worship God Almighty, who entered our lives as one of us in the person Jesus. Jesus taught God's truth and pointed to God's kingdom, but he would not bend to our ways, and so he took the punishment for our sin. Today, the carpenter's hands are nailed to the cross. The king of kings is crowned with thorns and wears the purple robe of mockery. Today, Jesus sets us free, he himself imprisoned on a tree. Today is God's Friday. We are here to worship God. Let us pray. O Christ, who forsake no one, but was forsaken by the closest of friends. The Christ, who committed no crime, yet was sentenced to a criminal's death. We enter your presence in awe and adoration. On this day, centuries ago, you could have saved your life, but you refused to betray the purpose for which you had been born. You had come into the world to love God and neighbor as yourself, and when that love required you to shoulder a cross, you summoned the strength to bear it. Today, O oh Christ, teach us the meaning of the cross once again and open our hearts to feel anew exactly why this is called Good Friday. Amen.
Knowing our sins, let us go to God in prayer, confessing how we have turned away. Please join me responsively. O crucified Jesus, Son of the Father, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, eternal Word of God, we worship you. O crucified Jesus, holy temple of God, dwelling place of the Most High, gate of heaven, burning flame of love, we worship you. O crucified Jesus, sanctuary of justice and love, full of kindness, source of all faithfulness, we worship you. O crucified Jesus, ruler of every heart, and you are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In you dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. We worship you. And while we worship you, there are so many ways that we have turned away from you, seeking our own path, trusting ourselves more than we trust you. So we ask, O oh Lord, for your mercy. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. And in this time of silence, let us confess our personal sins to God. Almighty God, look with mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross. For through him who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, you are one God forever and ever. Amen. Hear the good news. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless before him. Believe the good news. Through the cross of Christ, we are forgiven and reconciled to God. Praise be to God. And as we prepare to turn to God's word, let us pray for illumination. The unfolding of your word, O Lord, gives light and clarity. So as we turn to your word, read and proclaimed, let that light radiate widely dispelling Friday's darkness. Make your face to shine upon us and teach us, your servants, to live the genuine, eternal life for which you died. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes to us from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I'll be reading from the translation called The Message. Good friend, don't forget all that I've taught you. Take to heart my commands. They'll help you live a long, long time, a long life lived full and well. Don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and the eyes of the people. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's word in everything you do, everywhere you go. God is the one who will keep you on track. 
Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Our second scripture reading comes to us from the gospel according to John, the 19th chapter, beginning at verse 1. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him in the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How does your life echo? Where are the echoes in your life? See, in my own life, there are many moments, events, even phrases of wisdom that continue to echo within me. These times are significant because they continue to shape and guide me and my choices through life. The echoes resonate within me, giving focus to do what is right and pleasing and acceptable before God so that I may grow in faith and in discipleship. I would suspect all of us have events that echo within us. Some echoes are positive, Others are negative. Maybe it is what we did wrong or how someone else wronged us. Maybe it's the wisdom that we read from a book or strong words given to us by a respected person in our lives. Either way, we feel those echoes as they vibrate and resonate within us. And both positive and negative echoes have the ability to redirect our lives to God. Some of those echoes in my life that give focus and purpose, clarity and call are my wedding day. That first day when I got, first moment where I got to hold my kids that very first time. Hearing God's call to ministry upon my life. And then the death of some loved ones. Those were moments that shaped me. I've officiated funerals and memorial services, and I commonly hear people say during this time, I never told him something, or I wish I had told her this. And it's those kinds of statements that continue to echo within me and inspire me, lead me to express my love and my gratitude and respect for others as that person comes to mind. What are the echoes in your life? Because echoes can be powerful, striking us again, telling us what we already know but we need to hear again. Our next hymn is like that. Were you there? It's an older hymn that continues to be found in many hymnals. Oddly enough, this is a hymn for which we do not know when it was composed or by whom. It was printed in a hymnal in 1899, but we don't know where it originated. It's commonly included in tenebrae services like this one for Good Friday. Maybe you've heard it and sung it before. The lyrics powerfully invite us to sit in the sin of how Jesus was betrayed, denied, mocked, beaten, and killed. The title asks a question. Were you there? Well, obviously not. 
We were not there literally, historically. These events happened 2,000 years ago in the Middle East under the rule of the Roman Empire. But the question of this hymn is not being asked literally or historically. This is a spiritual question, like an echo. Because while we were not there physically, it is as much our sin that Jesus went to the cross to redeem and to save. The question we are being asked, did Jesus' death on the cross, the jeers of the crowds, the beating by the centurions, the mocking of Jesus by dressing him in a purple robe and a crown of thorns, do these events echo within us, convicting us, inspiring us to turn to God? Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? This question echoes within us, especially at this time of year. When we read the scriptures again that recall the horrible events, and this question echoes each time we hear the hymn, sing the hymn, or it comes to mind. Because this hymn continues to be relevant. It asks each generation like an echo. Which makes me wonder if that's why there is an echo in each stanza. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? That echo sings to us what we already know, but what we need to hear again. The impact of the question challenges the sin we believe can be overcome and pushed aside through trust and faith in Jesus? Do the echoes give focus to us that we may challenge sin in all of its forms that we see happening both within us and around us? The sin of violence as the crown of thorns was pressed into Jesus' head. The sin of greed as they gambled for Jesus' clothes. The sin of cynicism from the mocking crowds. And the sin of of putting to death the innocent. Will the echoes of the sins from the night of Jesus' crucifixion inspire us to put the sins of today in the tomb so they too may die? The sins of violence, greed, cynicism, despair, and death continue to echo, bringing us back to Calvary, confronting how Jesus voluntarily took our sin onto the cross, how our shouts of Hosanna on Palm Sunday turn to crucify today. Will we still see and hear the echoes of those sins today as we push thorns into others with whom we disagree, mock those who respond differently to those hot-button issues? Greed, that just runs rampant. Despair and death bubbling over from our unprocessed grief, especially after this difficult year. Do you hear the echoes? Do we hear the ways we have participated and perpetuated sin, discord, division, damage, despair, and death? I know we hear the echoes, so perhaps the more relevant question is that Jesus knew the power of God, trusted God's providence more than he trusted himself, and we hear that in his prayer in the garden. Lord, let this cup 
pass from me, but not my will, but yours, O God. The crown of thorns pressed into Jesus' head can serve as that echo for us. And so we have to ask ourselves and answer honestly, will, our, will we focus on glorifying God rather than perpetuating sin? Will our faith in Jesus grow greater than our trust in ourselves? Let us pray. Jesus, you are our Lord and Savior. The thorns of our world feel overwhelming beyond our ability to understand, let alone solve. We do not have the capacity to silence the rationalizations, to heal the addictions, to restore the brokenness, to repair the destruction, or to reverse the effects of our self-centered weaknesses. For these sins and so many more, you voluntarily, willingly went to the cross for us. But we do not face these thorns alone, Jesus. For you came to humanity, took on flesh, and laid down your life. But you don't stop there. You invite us to partner with you in proclaiming good news, and restoring the broken, and uniting the divided. And you give us the capacity, by your Spirit, to be co-workers alongside you. But we have to answer a question first. Will we follow you? Well, may our answer of yes draw out the thorns of our lives and the live lives of others so we may praise you fully. Amen.
Let us go to God in prayer for ourselves, for our loved ones, and certainly for the world. Holy God, the hosannas of Palm Sunday have died away, the palm branches have turned brittle, and now today there is only this, sitting in darkness, separated from one another, the hymns of lament in the air, the mumblings of our feeble confession on this Friday, which we tremble to call good. What is good about Good Friday? What good is there about the innocent one nailed to a cross? What is good about the darkness of war that persists today? What is good about our devastation of the planet? What is good about people living in poverty or the fog of addiction, depression, disease, and despair? What is good about the crushing weight of hunger, racism, scapegoating, apathy? No, there is nothing good or desirable in those things. Yet you, O oh God, Show your goodness, your faithfulness. When suffering reigns, yours is the first heart to break. When despair lurks about, we remember that you were there first, peering into the abyss and crying out incredibly, Father, forgive them. When we feel forsaken, we know that in your forsakenness, you bound your mother and your beloved disciples to one another as a new family. When we feel overcome by guilt, we remember that you spoke grace to a thief. Today you will be with me in paradise. Your love for us is boundless, ever-present, and good. What else can we say here in the dimness, in the darkness, other than thank you? And that we vow and promise to seek after you with all our heart, to run from evil, and to turn to you. So we join our voices together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
as we close this service, we know that this is not the end. We know that God's Sunday is coming. But let us not get there too soon. But join me in our benediction responsively. Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. Amen.